When I think about the amazing community that I'm a part of, there are a few words that come to mind, such as support network, belonging, and unconditional friendships. Through programming, through things like missions, through our music department, also through Bible studies and through Sunday school classes, just relationships that we made during those. You know, when you're involved in things like that and Hands of Christ and Sunday schools, you develop relationships and that's what community is all about, it's relationships. A positive outlet if school doesn't go well. I can just come here every week, be myself. Like being around people who also share that passion is kind of important to me. Everybody can do hard things for God. Um, we can all love Jesus. Recently, I got to go on my fourth mission trip to Guatemala at the end of August. Uh, it's a medical mission trip, and so being able to go back to Guatemala with a group of people who all have similar talents and to be able to use the talents that God gave us, be able to witness that community, but then also participate in that community because we make friendships that last years. Participating in uh, the worship arts department, um, we've been in the orchestra since we joined the church. Brings everything together as its own little family and unit there. It's our, it's our small group, basically. We experience Christ in each other, praying for each other, uh, sharing in sorrows and celebrations. Uh, those relationships look like just getting together and being able to have someone to talk to, confide in, vent to, or just someone to share joy with. Hello, hello, hello. There I am, and there you are. Good evening. <laughs> well, my name is Thomas, and it's a joy to serve as one of the pastors here at First Methodist Mansfield, and it's a joy to be uh, in worship with you tonight. If you would, go ahead and open your Bibles uh, with me to First John chapter 1. 1 John chapter 1, and if you do not have a Bible, as always, we want to make an invitation. Uh, we'd love to get one to you as a gift. Um, and so if, if you're watching online, feel free to send me an email at pastorthomas at fmcm.org. Uh, if you're here with us in the sanctuary, you can go out those double doors, and we'd love to, to get one to you. Um, as you turn to 1 John 1, if you get to the back cover, you've gone too far, but you're in the neighborhood. So find your way to 1 John 1. And as we, as we move to 1 John 1, we're, we're continuing in, in our theme, our focus on what it is to be in life together as the church, as, as Christian community. What are the values, the practices, the distinctives that, that make up uh, our life together? And so you can see uh, the progression uh, that we began with nine weeks ago, that, that we started with holding our tongue. Uh, last week, uh, Pastor David uh, helpfully described that and condensed that to restraint, to restraining uh, our tongue. And uh, I think we have a slide of, of the full progression as we, as we move through humility, taking on humility, the practice of listening, the practice of helping, moving to bearing, bearing one another's burdens. And then on to proclaiming. And, and last week... Uh, just fresh out of his ordination, Julian preached on authority and what that looked like, the distinctives of authority within this culture, within the culture of the community of, of Christ, community of, of the cross, and, and that that authority is actually rooted in submission, that that authority is taking on the role of a servant in the model uh, we see in Jesus. And so, I want to let you know uh, that while we're continuing tonight, next week uh, we're finishing this emphasis on life together and we're going to finish it at the table where all of Christian community culminates and finds its center. Remembrance of, of, of Holy Communion, the Last Supper, the culmination and the ultimate goal of life together in Christian community. And so last week, I want to lift up a, a quote that, that Julian, Pastor Julian shared from Henry Nouwen. He said, the way of the Christian leader is not the way of upward mobility in which our world has invested so much, but the way of downward mobility, downward mobility ending on the cross. And Nouwen would go on to say uh, more broadly, for those who have heard the voice of the first love, and said yes to it. This downward moving way of Jesus is the way 
is the way of joy and peace of God. The downward moving way of Jesus is the way to joy and peace in God. This defines our life together. This trajectory from humility to proclamation and on to authority. It's a downward step. A downward slope as we learn to serve and to love one another. And if we've learned nothing else over these, these couple of months, is that this way is unnatural to us. There's something in it that, that we resist as we practice. One practice builds on the other. You, you may have felt that tension, that pushback, that this, this is not my instinct. This is not where my heart goes. The progression uh, of holding one's tongue, humbling ourselves, listening, bearing with one another, we've characterized this over the weeks as being both hard and beautiful. This way of downward movement to service and submission and love. This is hard and it is beautiful. And what we've seen in these weeks is that sanctification, this, this movement of, of, of the spirit drawing us towards holiness isn't a climb but a journey to deeper levels of self-knowledge which takes us to further dependency in Christ and on the cross and the community of the cross. It's a work that begin, begins in an exploration of the deepest places within ourselves. As we consider what our place is in the community and we open those deep spaces and allow the light of God to shine upon us. It's a hard but beautiful life together that we're invited to. But it's not natural. We don't drift towards downward mobility. We don't drift into this way. Life together is intentional and cultivated. It's a spirit-enabled way of life that is impossible to live on our own. And so we're going to continue in 1 John chapter 1. And I'm going to read for us from, from verses 5 to 10, if you'd like to follow along. 1 John 1 verses 5 to 10. Hear these words. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light. In him there's no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one, one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. In this letter, we find John coming to the end of his life. And, and this is, this is uh, what he says. He says, this is the message we've heard from Jesus. He's including himself in the we. This is the message I've heard from Jesus. How, how, would, you, how would you answer that? What message have you heard from Jesus? John's answer is this, that God is light. Fully. In him there is no darkness at all. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. John had experienced the person of Jesus, the, the word of life, the eternal life made manifest in the presence of John and others. He had appeared firsthand to him and his expression and ex of his experience was God is pure. God is true. He is full of light. There's no evil or sin. He's holy, pure, and true. This is the same John who would go on to write about this fullness. There's no fear in love. Perfect love casts out fear. This is the fullness of who God is. God is light. There's no fear. There's no evil. And so for, for us, John is declaring out of uh, what he's heard and experienced, he's declaring a vision of who God is and out of that vision he's exploring what our life in response could be and might be and is. A life enabled by Christ in which we're impelled to love and delight in the presence and the fullness of the light of God free from fear. So this is the message John, John is, is expressing to us. God is really good. 
God is really good. He is uh, full of light and pure and true. And would you look at how good life with God can be? God is really this good. Would you look at how full and good life with God can be? And he declares this message as, as we progress through uh, ver- beyond verse 5 by drawing distinctions about life with God and without God. So we, we, we read these words again. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in light, we have fellowship with one another. The assumption being if we don't, we don't. And so you can see this division, this, these binary terms, darkness to light, lies to truth, and isolation uh, to fellowship. An author named J.D. Walt points this out about these distinctions that, that John makes for us. He says, no one wants darkness. That might be your, your gut reaction, your instinct. No one wants darkness, but will readily settle for less than pure light, which results in dimness. No one wants lies but will willingly accept something for less than pure truth, which results in confusion. No one wants isolation, but will graciously make do with less than real relationships, which results in anonymity. I was afraid of saying that word in front of you all tonight. Uh, Anonymity. No one wants isolation, but will do with less than real relationships because it protects something within us. We're often most comfortable in this place, the dim, the confused, the anonymous spaces, out of a false assumption that we're safest when we're the least seen and least known. We're least seen for who we really are. So we're afraid to expose our true self. We write resumes with fancy words that we've Googled. Uh, We're fine reading about Paul being the chief of sinners, but we we don't want you to look in our closet. (laughs) That's that's too real for us. We want to be seen as better than we are, even even as we gather in this space. Listen to how uh, Dietrich Bonhoeffer describes this reality in the church. He says, the pious fellowship permits no one to be a sinner. Everybody must conceal his or her sin from themselves and the fellowship broadly. We dare not be sinners. Many Christians are unthinkably horrified when a real sinner is suddenly discovered among the righteous. It's a little sarcasm from Dietrich. (laughs) We have the capacity, we have the capacity to pretend that we're not all sinners sitting in the same room. That's not what we're doing here. That's not who we are. We live under false assumptions that we are safest when we are least seen and least known for who we really are. Uh, Eden and I, uh, my wife Eden and I celebrated our sixth anniversary yesterday. Um, I say we're babies in this thing. Um, But sixth anniversary yesterday, um, we, we started dating in 2016 and that was just a couple of years uh, after my graduation from college. And uh, when we started dating, I, I was living, I was renting a room from one of my college friends who had bought a house up in Arlington. And to put it politely, he and I, just a couple of years removed from graduation, had not figured out how to live as adults within our home. It was exceedingly messy. <laughs> it was exceedingly dysfunctional the way that we kept our home. And this is the moment where Eden steps into my life. My goodness. Uh, So if you didn't know, if you don't know Eden, she's significantly cooler than me. Um, There's some affirmations in the room. Uh, But when we started dating, she was living uh, in Fort Worth. She was living in a super cool loft apartment. Uh, All the things uh, millennial likes. So uh, concrete floors, huge uh, drafty windows and, and all those things. But it was organized like an adult lived there, um, which was good for our, st- our stage in life. And so the first few weeks of dating consisted almost exclusively of me going to Fort Worth, because it's a cool apartment. I'm going to pick you up at the apartment, and we're going to go eat, and we're going to go to concerts, because it's Fort Worth, and we don't need to go to Arlington. We don't need to see my house. We really don't. Uh, but 30, I-, I looked it up. 33 days after our first date, she was coming to Arlington. I had time to prepare. 33 days was plenty of time to prepare. We were going to get dinner with my sister and my brother-in-law. 
And I was at work, and I got a text. Eden was very excited. She was also at work. She was a nurse at JPS at the time. And she texted, hey, great news. I'm getting off early. I'll meet you at your house. Then we can go to dinner. Bad news. Very bad news. <laughs> very bad news for me. My cover was blown. There was no time for me to get home and hide reality of this person she couldn't have imagined what their house looked like inside of their own volition. So I did what any 20-something-year-old man would, and I got out of work earlier than her so I could go clean. She still didn't know. <laughs> um, but I didn't fool her. I didn't fool her. And, and we, we rarely do. We're often most comfortable in the dim, the confusing, the anonymous space. As John would describe it, the darkness. It's where we're often most comfortable out of the false assumption that we're safest when we're the least seen for who we really are. But verse 8, when we get to verse 8, John shows us our nature. He says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. This is who God is, but verse 8, if we, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. My assumption is not that many of us in the room would, would deny the presence of sin in our life. But I do think I and you uh, most likely have more sin than we would allow ourselves to articulate. What, what I've found over the years of, of attempting to work out sin in my life, that my vocabulary for sin is very narrow. I have a couple of things that I'm like, yep, yep, that's me, that's me, that's me. But there are pretty strong boundaries of, of the breadth and the depth of my awareness of sin. And, and what's at play in me is the sense that, oh, that's just, that's just who I am. That's who I've become over these 32 years. But these, these little personality traits are, are, are habits that have slowly etched their way into who I am and our expressions of sin. And so I, what I've found is I've largely lost my awareness of sin, much less my ability to, to articulate it. I've drifted slowly away from God without even being aware of it, quick to operate on false assumption. But verse 9, if we continue, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. John is showing us the broken nature of who we are up and against the merciful God who is full of light, who is full of love, who stands ready, who is faithful and just to forgive in light of our sin, the, the breadth and depth of our ability to articulate it. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I lo love. Same song, different verse. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God. This is our nature and God's nature. We cannot take ourselves from darkness to light. We cannot purify ourselves, but we do have the power to keep it from happening. We don't have the power to take ourselves from darkness to light, but we can keep it from happening. And so, as some of you are probably wondering, like, we've been adding a new word every week. What is he getting at? This week we're focusing on the practice, the value of confession. Broadening our, our vocabulary of the sin within us to present ourselves any other way than as sinners is to stop short of the vision of this beautiful life together in Christ. And this is how John expresses it. Again, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive and will heal and will restore despite our self-deception. This is who God is to us. We have, we will, we do fail at this human thing and this attempt of, of faithfulness. And so how do we respond in that failing? Do we live under false assumptions? Do we operate as though being unseen is the safest place for us? John invites us to a practice of confession, to value confession in our life together. For those of us who want to stay in the in-between and the ambiguous and the anonymous, it's an uncomfortable word. It's a humiliating thought to express these deepest places within us an awareness of brokenness. But Bonhoeffer again says, the fact is that we are sinners. 
and there's freedom in it. We're, we're addicted to sin, and in our addiction, we have hidden in plain sight. We have hidden in plain sight. What, what John shows us is confession is the doorway to life in the light. Confession is the doorway to life in the light. If, if you're familiar at all with Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, you may or may not know uh, the 12 steps. And I'm just going to share three of them that, that you can see. Uh, first, we admitted that we were powerless over alcohol, that our lives had become unmanageable. Second, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. And third, we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over to the care of God as we understood them. You may have heard these before. You, you may know the rest of the 12, but these, these first three, put differently, I, I think we can read verse 9 this way. If we confess our sins, step one, admit that we're powerless. He, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. Step two, God's power is greater and can restore us. And purify us from all unrighteousness. Step three, we've turned over our lives to God. Saying, God, would you, would you bring this out of me? Would you bring me to the light? While sin would prefer us to stay hidden. And in the, the dim, confused, anonymous space, trusting our false assumptions that we're safest when we're unseen, Christ invites us out. Christ invites us to the place of confession as the doorway back into the light with him to fellowship with one another, to fullness of experience. God is this magnificent whole being full of light and purity and truth. And we're being invited to be seen and to be fully loved in response. Bonhoeffer says it this way. I think you can see it on the screen. God has come to you to save the sinner. Be glad. This message is liberation through truth. You can hide nothing from God. The mask you wear before men will do you no good before him. He wants to see you as you are. He wants to be gracious to you. You do not have to go on lying to yourself and your brothers as if you were without sin. You can dare to be a sinner. You can dare to be a sinner. You can dare to be a sinner because a relationship without vulnerability is a relationship without love. You can dare to be honest. You can dare to be seen and to be known. Which is why John expresses that confession brings us to fullness of fellowship with one another and with God. To confess is to be vulnerable, to be honest. And if you're wondering, I, I, I already spoiled it, Eden learned my mess. And we're six years into her commitment following. Praise God and God bless her. <laughs> if we confess our sins, is how John expresses this invitation. If we confess our sin, it's a huge if. It's a huge if, and if it all hinges on if we will confess, then we need to talk about and get practical, practical about to whom and how we might confess. It's an invitation, it's an instruction here in verse 9, but, but to whom and how will we? How might we? In John's gospel, we find these words from Jesus to his disciples. In John 20, 21 to 23, he says, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Hear that again, Jesus' words. Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you out. He breathes on them. And says, receive the Holy Spirit. And in this reception, he says, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Do you see what's happening? Jesus is giving authority to the community. Those who are sharing this life of following Jesus together, he's giving them the authority to receive and to give confession. To hear confession of sin and not only to receive and to give, but to forgive. 
receive the Holy Spirit and forgive one another's sins. The gathered body of the church, those of us who come as sinners to this place under Christ can receive one another's confession. We've been commissioned to give and to hear confession. Confession of where we are, confession that we desire to be seen and to be known the full extent of who we are because we trust Christ will respond in love. Bonhoeffer says this uh, about this idea, when I go to my brother to confess, I am going to God. When I go to my brother to confess, I'm going to God. Before him alone in the whole world do I dare to be the sinner that I am. Here in this place, the truth of Jesus Christ and his mercy rules. You remember uh, a handful of weeks ago, uh, I actually missed this weekend, which was a bummer for me, but there's a 20-foot wooden cross between the platform and the pew, an image that we see each other now through Christ. And so in this community, we, we can dare to be a sinner Here in this place, the truth of Jesus Christ and his mercy rules. John 20, 23, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Confession and forgiveness is what the fellowship of disciples, we, the body, it's what we do together as we walk in the light with Christ and are progressively purified by the blood of Christ. And if we don't, Sin remains, but this is the invitation to a full life in the light. So to whom we confess the answers to to one another under Christ, seeing one another as sinners and and fully knowing and fully loving. But, but, But how will we do it? How will we confess? Uh, One option (laughs) um, is just turn to your neighbor and go. Um, We're not going to do that. (laughs) Uh, One one option in in the Wesleyan tradition, in our our Methodist heritage, is is that from its earliest days, this has been a practice that groups would gather. You might have heard the language of, of banding together. The simple idea from the earliest days that Wesley wanted his communities, his churches, to gather together for this purpose, to create trusted space and and to band together, not like Van Halen, but with the commitment to, (laughs) thank you, uh, uh, to to confess sin, to bring it to light, to to wrestle with with why we pursue what we pursue, why our instincts are uh, what they are, why the decisions we've made are the decisions we've made, and simply to lay them before trusted community recognizing that that Jesus is present between us and with us, examining and exposing the deepest parts of ourselves, and ultimately to pray for one another and to speak the words as as John commissions us in, in chapter 20 of his gospel, forgive one another. The words speaking over one another, the words in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. This is the capacity of our community the capacity of the culture of life together in in the church. Hear hear these words from uh, a a professor from Asbury Theological Seminary, Kevin Watson, as as he talks about this early Wesleyan commitment to the practice. He says, uh, Wesley wanted them to have a place that was prepared for them so that if something happened where they fell back into a besetting sin, whatever it might have been, they would have a place where someone would ask them, is there anything you desire to keep secret? Or are you sitting in shame because of something you've done? If so, please bring it to the light so we can remind you that God already knows and sees and has never left you. Let us weep with you for the ways that you and others have been hurt by your action or your inaction. And let us show you that even as we know you more, even the very worst you have to tell, We love you more deeply because we know you more fully. This is the capacity of Christian community. That in Christ we can listen and we can bear and we can proclaim truth, but we can confess to one another and we can receive it 
and bestow upon the other the truth that in the name of Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Imagine the freedom of that experience, to, to have your worst out and to be seen and to be loved. That's the place of transformation. It's the place of transformation. So this evening, as we, as we, we rush towards the end of this emphasis of life together, and we look ahead to gathering again at the table, uh, remembering what Christ has done, the invitation and who he calls us to be. I first want us to stay here in the, in the place, the invitation to confession, that we would center our lives around it. And I, I don't know where you need to go uh, with that this evening. Uh, you don't, like I said, you don't have to turn to your neighbor and start a band. You, know, you don't have to start this practice here. You don't have to start with structure. But I would invite you to start with honesty. Honesty before the Lord. Look, look again as we close in prayer to, to, to John's words in 1 John 1, 5 to 10. These distinctions of life with God and life without what walking in the light is. What confession might do. What Jesus wants to do in us by way of of confession. Consider that walking in light is not perfection. Simply honesty. Taking a step towards opening those darkest places within us. Maybe God tonight is longing for you to hear the words in the name of Jesus Christ you are forgiven. Or maybe God is longing for you to offer those same words to another, to a neighbor to a fellow sinner gathered at the foot of the cross. In the name of Jesus, you are forgiven. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are holy and good. You are pure and righteous. You are full of light. And our simple confession together is that we prefer the dim, the confused, the anonymous. Out of a false assumption that uh, the safest place is the unseen place. But Father, we trust that in your fullness that you see us, you know us, you love us. As John expresses the message of the gospel to us. You long to restore us. You long to welcome us home. To walk alongside us in the fullness of of your light. And so we pray, uh, and I pray on behalf of all those gathered, that, that your spirit would be at work in us tonight. To soften our hearts, telling us where and to whom we might be drawn to this practice of confession that you might do the work of forgiveness, that we might be drawn uh, deeper into fellowship, a true sense of who you've called us to be as the church, those gathered at your feet, embracing your light. And so, Father, we thank you for for the reminder this evening that in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. And may we commit ourselves to the sharing and to the reception of those words by way of confession. Would you do this work in us, Lord Jesus? Amen. Amen.